Wednesday night teaching kingdom perspectives. <clears throat> and I am glad that you're here <clears throat> in the house. And God is good all the time. And all the time he is good. Let me get my notes together. Got a lot of information to give to you. And uh, Father, thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And bless us tonight and lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let me just get off on the, on the, on the get-go here. <clears throat> on this teaching tonight, we're going to be uh, moving into uh, understanding some of the prophetic views of the last days concerning the tribulation, concerning the rapture, and I want to talk about that a little bit. I'll go back to chapter two, and, or excuse chapter two, yeah, part two, in just a minute as our, our, you know, recalling from last time, but I wanted to start out by saying for this teaching tonight that uh, I love everybody, and there's differences of opinions, there's going to be all kinds of, of different views, uh, even some within this church, and those that are watching, those that will be watching, and uh, I'm just going to lay out scripture. I'm going to let the Bible talk for itself. Uh, God doesn't need any help interpreting what he said. We're the ones that need to understand what God was saying. And so the best way to mess yourself up is to have a theologian talk to you. The best way to get it right is to study the Bible and put down all your books and get into the word of God. And uh, of course, you need a teacher to help you with that, I understand. So I wanted to start out by that, uh, by saying that, that I don't, uh, uh, if you have a different view, I love you. I'm not going to get in the parking lot and and have a fist fight or slash your tires or you slash my tires. And uh, I say that jokingly, but you know, people get really offensive when it comes to the rapture. Let me try that again. They have their views and, and they're settled and they're staunch and I got that. But we ain't gonna be that way. We're gonna, we're gonna get to the bottom of this truth. Uh, also, Jennifer's gonna type up some notes. I'm gonna do my best to try to write on the board for you all here. But it's also supposed to throw up on the screen as well. Those watching by live stream, I think Judah's going to be able to switch it over. And so you'll have that information as well. And so these next, really for all these classes, you should have been taking notes. But for these next classes, however long this takes, this time together, you really need to take notes. I encourage you to get the CDs or watch it again because I'm going to give you a plethora of information. I'm not just going to throw opinions out and say, okay, that's the way it is. You don't like it, you know, stick it to the wall and then move out of there. I'm going to give you truth, okay? So it's going to be really a heavy load and I hope you can you can handle that. I know you can, but it's uh, it's going to be a, a lot of information. So give Jennifer a little time to type up a cert certain things that I'm going to say. She'll do her best. Okay. Is that all right? All right. That, that's, that was the ground rules. That was, <laughs> I wanted to lay that out. Okay. Revelation Road, part two. We talked about it last time that we need to be like the Bereans. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Even though, you know, Paul was a man of God, a great teacher, <clears throat> he still uh, he was still challenged, if you will, by the Bereans to study the word of God. And I love the Bereans because the Bereans remind me so much of what the church should be of a disciplined follower of Jesus Christ, and that is to study the Bible. Find out what the Bible has to say. Not a YouTube channel, not some prophet, prophetess, not, you know, brother and sister, yay, yay, or whatever. Get into the word of God and see what the word of God has to say. So we talked about that. Then we established that, you know, the question, are we in the last days? And the answer is absolutely. Are we living in the end times? Absolutely. Well, how do we determine the, the end times in the last days? Well, we take the Bible or what the Bible said it would be, and then we look outside the window. And if they match, bing, 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 you won, you got it. Uh, and so that's what's happening. Very easy. It doesn't take, again, a prophet to tell you the hour that we're living in. It just takes you to have your eyes open. And so we went to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. She doesn't have to throw it up there. But now it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and it will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. It's also found in Micah 4.1. Well, we know that's talking about who and what? 
Jesus and his kingdom and his ministry when in the last days. So we established at the beginning of our teaching that in Adam, the, the end really began when he sinned. Again, that's hard to fathom and people don't get it and they get upset with it. But that's okay because man was given a timeline. When Adam sinned, God said, okay, you now have a timeline. You will now decay. You will now get old and you will die. That's a part of the curse. Come on, somebody. Uh, even though I'm getting younger and other people are getting older, it's still, <laughs> it's, it's, still <laughs> it's still an understanding that we get older, right? Nothing you can do about that and you got to deal with your body and uh, you want to go north and your body goes south, <laughs> some things you want to go up and it goes down, you know, just bags under your eyes or what have you. Life is that way. It's a part of the curse. And so we understand that. If we, we, if we establish that in our minds, then we're on the time frame of God. We begin to understand his redemptive plan. So with Adam, it began. With Jesus, it accelerated. It accelerated. One of the problems we have with the end times is this. We want it to happen right now. We think it all should happen right now. We think it should all come together. It should be finished. It should be fulfilled. And it's not that way. Why is it not that way? Number one, it's not the season of God. Number two, he wants all men to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I'm glad he didn't come when I was in my sin. Is anybody here? I'm very thankful I wasn't left behind or what have you. So when you look at it from that point of view, it's really that not that long a period of time, okay? So we established that last time we got together. Uh, <clears throat> 1 John 2.18, children is the last time or the last hour. And just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Well, you got to have a real Christ to have an antichrist. Is that right? You have to have Christ come, and then when he came and after he departed, you had antichrist. So when was the last hour? When he came. It was the acceleration of the last hours, the acceleration of the end times. It's very easy to see if you put it together. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as even to mislead, if possible, even who? The elect. So the elect can be fooled. Are, are the elect being fooled right now? You, you, you better believe it. People are getting fooled by false prophets, uh, propagandists, and whatever else is out there. Hebrews 1, 2, in the what? Last days uh, has, spoken, uh, has spoken to us by his son, or in his son, whom he appointed himself, uh, uh, heir, appointed heir of all things, excuse me, uh, through whom he also made the world. So in the last days, Jesus began to speak. So when he began to speak, it was the last days. I mean, so it's pretty simple. We lay that pattern down. Uh, gave you the word last and what it means in time and place and a series of things. So we're at the last of the last days. We're at the last series of the events that were spoken of by the Lord Jesus, by the apostles, by John the Revelator, which we're going to see <clears throat> much later in this teaching, okay? And uh, I won't go any really further there, Second Peter. Uh, we talked about those things, about the prophetic uh, spiritualists, and I told you about the baby snatchers and all that junk that's going around, and uh, I will knock over some more golden calves uh, as we move along, if that's okay, and I'll, I'll do it out of, out of uh, the inspiration of the Lord uh, having me do that. Okay, so for tonight, part three, uh, we're going to talk about the, the rapture in the view of pre-tribulation type of rapture, okay? Again, I'm not trying to make anybody mad, but I probably will make you mad, uh, because of, of scripture. But what you're going to be mad at is the fact that you've been lied to. You're going to be mad at the fact you didn't study any further and you just watched the movie and you accepted it. And I can't help you with that because I had to go through the same 
deprogramming, if you will, or the unwinding of the mind. I like that terminology, the unwinding of the mind, because I had my mind fixed on what I was taught. And uh, I taught prophecy for a long, long time. Uh, I I was a pre-tribulationist as far as my view. And uh, I want to I want to show you what the scriptures have to say, and I won't tell you my view until we probably get towards the end. Speaking of the rapture, is that cool? But but I'm gonna let the I'm let the word take care of the word. Okay, so pre-tribulation. As you're writing down your notes, pre-tribulation. You need to write secret rapture. It's a secret rapture, and their main view. Pre-tribulation, secret rapture. And the main view. You have to put secret rapture in there. Let me start off by saying I do believe in a rapture. Woo! You better believe it. But I just don't believe like most folks have been taught when it occurs. So we're going to let the Bible show us that. Okay? And also it's not a secret. <clears throat> God doesn't do anything in secret like that. Not, not when it comes to something this monumental. And again, scripture will show that. So what is that? That's the church or the saints will be raptured or caught up before tribulation. That's the belief of pre-tribulation rapture view. It's going to happen before, okay? To be honest with you, it is considered a new doctrine. It's not that old. In fact, if you go back and look at church histories and church fathers, again, those that will get all mad and write me letters and all that, you do the research. I did mine. You do yours. If you go back to the church fathers, you will find that there was a very small, minuscule writers who you could say kind of had some type of view. And I say that very lightly because the overwhelming majority of the church fathers never adhere to any such doctrine. They never talked about that because they understood the Bible and they understood tribulation and what they were to face. So you go back and research that, and again, you'll find a very minuscule that maybe, maybe, if you're in a court of law, it probably would not convict the person. That's, that's how little the information is. But, but go ahead and study it because it's a plethora out there of that. So where did it come from? Where did it come from? So we talk about that John Nelson Darby. Write that down, that name. John Nelson Darby. Uh, he basically invented it in 1830. That's not too far long ago. When you look at biblical history, you look at biblical doctrines, that's not long ago, in 1830. Okay? But before him... It was given by Morgan Edwards when he wrote an essay in 1744. Okay, go back and research it. Morgan Edwards in 1744. And it became popular with Darby because of a young girl, 15-year-old girl. They used to have uh, prophecy conferences over in Europe. And a young girl by the last name of, of McDonald, 15 years old, she had a prophetic word that was not scriptural but it was spiritual. It was type of a mystic thing. And then it would took off like wildfire from there, but yet it didn't get as far into the churches as, uh, as it needed to be until C.I. Schofield. Schofield Bible, Schofield Bibles, however you pronounce the name, Schofield Bibles. It got into his teaching. It got into the seminaries in America and it went like, wildfire it was ballistic then and then it became into all of our mainline denominations and I'm not picking on anybody but to Baptists and and what have you mainline Protestant churches they started teaching their leaders pre-tribulation rapture are you here and then we got it And then it got modern, come on. It became uh, just part of the dogma and the doctrine and and, and churches have split over this. Families have split over this. Denomination, I mean, people have fought each other over this. Uh, They've lost fellowship. Again, I used to teach pre-tribulation rapture and and I I would, I'm I'm telling you, I would would just argue with people. You ever argue, you ever seen somebody argue with you or maybe you've done it before? We all have about the Bible in some way, but there's something about the rapture part. 
that is just so ingrained in the American church. To be truthful with you, this doesn't fly over in certain parts of Africa and certain parts of, the, of Asia because they don't believe this. But, but the Americans love it because it fits our lifestyle. It's perfect. What a great doctrine for, for Christians in America. This is awesome. Big widescreen TV, unlimited cable. Come on, somebody. Uh, three cars, a dog, a pool, and I'm out of here. I mean, this is awesome. <clears throat> well, it's not true. It, it's a fallacy. It's actually a false doctrine. The pre-tribulation secret rapture, it is a false doctrine. And I gave you the origin from it. And if you do any research, that's where all your research is going to take you to that place. By the way, it was, uh, the essay was written in the Bristol Baptist College. And then again, uh, Schofield, he took the doctrine and it went wild. And so we're going to talk about this particular uh, uh, truth of, of, of what the word has to say. All right, go to your Bibles to First Thessalonians. And uh, like I said, I'm gonna try to do all I can to keep up without going too fast and too far with, with, the, with the information, okay? So somebody just say, take your time. And, and you know, I have no goals of finishing. We can do this till we see him. How's that? But, <clears throat> but I want to lay this out. So, First Thessalonians chapter four. Let's look at verse thirteen. You can throw that up there. Yeah. Uh, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That means that means dead. Not sleep as in Jehovah Witness and others believe. That you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. So there's expectancy. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Good news, right? I'm glad to hear that. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that ye which are alive and remain. I want you to circle remain. I want you to write down remain because it's very important that you see this. Okay? And I will, I will break it down in just a minute. So if I don't get to it, remind me to come back to remain. But I, I won't forget it. Unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So that means the dead in Christ, they're going to rise first. Is that right? You know why they're going to rise first? They have further to go than we do because they're six foot under. But if I had a drum roll, that would have been awesome. That's a theological joke there. Okay, verse 6. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Woo, we're ready to go. Then we which are alive and remain, everybody say remain, shall also be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, scare everybody you know with these words. No. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So here's what I want you to write down. And Jen, if you can just now put these on the notes, I'd appreciate it. And, and then I'm going to break down some more information. Number one, you need to see these things. Write them down. And when we go back to our notes on this, we're going to find out where these are. Number one, descend. Descend. I'm going to go a little fast. Descend. Number two, shout. Descend and then shout. Number three is the voice of the archangel. Descend, shout, voice of the archangel. Number four is the trump of God. 
And number five will be clouds and air. So number one is descend. Number two is shout. Number three is the voice of the archangel. Number four is the trump of God. And number five will be the clouds and air. Now the reason why I have it, oh yeah, that's awesome. Well, you're a good typer. I'd have been there about an hour going, like Morse code. Uh, Why does this matter? Because if this is the rapture, this particular description, then we can take 1 Thessalonians here, chapter 4, and overlay it where the rapture really is. Is that right? Because it has to have line upon line, precept upon precept. So I've got to find these things to find the rapture. Is that fair? If we're in a court of law, that's my evidence. So I'm starting out with that. That's my evidence, Your Honor. And I'm going to show you where it is later on. So that's how we begin this particular teaching. So we get real excited about this, right? But the problem is, where is it? Where does it fall? You can't tell me there's a pre-tribulation rapture if you can't prove these scriptures in which we were taught that represents the rapture. You can't. You can't just throw it out of thin air. You make it up. You can't do that. That's, that's, that's heresy. That's an error. And that's what we've been taught. So we're going to fix that. Now, don't forget the word remain. Y'all still got that? Okay. Harpizo, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O. Harpazo, harpizo, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O. That's 726 in the Greek. You want to study it out. That's the word for being caught up. Now we know the Latin word means rapture. They translate it into rapture. So we, that's where we say we get the rapture from. And which is fine to have the word. Being caught up, rapture, that, that's perfectly fine. It's used 13 times in the New Testament according to the King James Version, okay? So I think it has some importance, doesn't it? All right? But let me give you the definition of what that word means. Because when you read the word caught up, it sounds, oh, oh, we're going to be caught up. That's awesome. We're caught up, okay? And so the rapture in our view is, you know, the clothes are all laid out, folded nicely. The shoes got smoke coming out of them. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? I used to have a t-shirt. Jennifer had a t-shirt. You had the t-shirt. I remember that uh, of, of the raptured, person being raptured that says something like, I'm out of here, and you saw shoes and smoke. You know, that's what you believe. You're like, yeah, I'm out of here, dude. And then there was other signs that say, when I'm raptured, uh, give me a 10-second hang time so I could say, see ya. You know, I, or I told you so. How many of y'all remember those things? And, and so that's our view of what the rapture looks like. Nobody knows about it. It happens at blah, 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 at nighttime. And, and it's a beautiful catching away. Well, let me give you the definition of, of harpazo. Number one, it means to seize, to carry off by force. Number two, to seize on, to claim for one's self eagerly. And number three, to snatch out or away. So look at it again. To seize, to carry off by force, to seize or to claim on for one's, uh, one's self eagerly or to snatch out of the way. Now, here's my question to you in your note taking. If it's a gentle rapture, if it's a wonderful rapture, it, you know, if it's just we're out of here, then why is it so violent? Why is the word used with such a, an aggressive way? Let's say that way. Why is it so aggressive, number one? And number two, why is it so urgent? This is just for you to think about. Those that are watching, those that are listening. Why is it such an, a powerful word that was used by the writer, translated in such a way for the rapture why is it something that's so eager why is it so fervent why it's such an emergency if it's a gentle rapture if i'm out of here and it's just floating away on the cloud and everything's wonderful 
then why? So keep that in mind. I won't answer it yet. I'll answer it later. Okay, so th these are, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm, 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 I'm going to lay down building blocks for you as we go along, okay? So think about that. Maybe you never saw it that way. All right, so the first church, they understood that Jesus was coming back at any time. Now, we te people teach today that the intimate return, that he can come back at any time, which is a, a not, not true. But at their particular time, they did speak in those ways because they were already in tribulation, in their minds, in their lives. I mean, you know, look at the Apostle Paul and his ministry. I mean, he wasn't on TBN floating around and, you know, being chauffeured. He was living a very dangerous life, don't you say? And so there, there was that understanding to them. But we teach that today that he can come back at any time. And he cannot come back at any time because he has a set season. And we will talk about that as well. So the word there, remember, you thought I'd forget? No, remain. I remembered, but I wrote it down here. I remembered that. How's that? The word remain in verse 15 is, is very important uh, to, to see. And, and what it means is to, to be surviving. It means to survive. Those who remain to survive. It's a present passion participle when you look at it from a grammatical point of view, okay, which means continuous action. So those who's, who are surviving, those who are enduring, all right? So put that in your thought pattern now. And put that into your building blocks. So when you look at this particular scripture, those who, who are alive and remain, those who survive. What am I surviving? Tax season? A bad football season? Uh, what am I surviving? My mother-in-law visiting? What is there to survive? Surviving life? Put that in your thoughts. Why did they have specific... See, when you... When you look at this from face value and read it and you let somebody regurgitate to you what they think it means, you buy it and you go, yeah, that's what it means. And you run around the building. But when you study it and you pull it out, you begin to understand that's not what the writer meant. That's why you have to study. Okay? So, so keep that in your mindset about, uh, about the word remain. Line upon line is what we have to, uh, what we have to be uh, watching and doing. Okay, <clears throat> um, let's let's move along because I want to get into some some heavier meat. That, that good? Everybody got those notes? Pretty good. Again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my time, but I'm I'm gonna get as much to you as possible. Uh, let's go to first first uh, Thessalonians chapter five. <clears throat> And I want to show you this here. Let's go to verse uh, verse one. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, first, First Thessalonians chapter five, verse verse one. You got it. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Wait a minute. You have no need that I write unto you about what? The return of the Lord. He's talking about chapter four. He's continuing his thoughts. The times and, and the seasons are chronos and kairos in the, in the Greek, which means chronological time, chronos, and kairos, which is the opportunity inside of a season or the season of opportunity. In other words, the seasons of God, not of man. I cannot control the seasons of God. I have to comply and conform to the seasons of God. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly, everybody say perfectly, they weren't screwed up. Not very theological, but they weren't messed up. 
They didn't have 600 different TV channels to watch of Christian television and YouTubes and all that and books being written coming out of the ears. You know perfectly that the day of the Lord cannot come as a thief in the night. Wait a minute. Listen to me. He's continuing the conversation of chapter 4. In chapter 5, he says, you don't need to know the seasons or the times because you know perfectly that the coming of the Lord or the day of the Lord is as a thief in the night. What is he doing? If 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is about a rapture, then he's tying the rapture with the day of the Lord. Or it's out of context. If you, you, know, you get a pretext, you, 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 you totally mess it up. And that's what we do in, in, in biblical theology and in teaching and, and being dogmatic in our doctrine. We grab something like that and then we say, okay, that's it. And then we jump to something else. You got to continue the thought. The Bible was not written in chapters. We put the chapters and we put the breaks in there. But the thought stays the same. So if he's talking about the rapture, then he's talking about the day of the Lord. He's not schizophrenic. He's not just like, well, I'm just going to talk about everything. He's like, let me continue my thought pattern. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. Now, I, I don't, it's like having a shotgun and I'm ready to just, you know, blow both barrels. I want to kind of hold off, but he says a thief in the night. And you've heard it so many times. We've seen movies about it. There's songs about it. You know, Jesus is coming as a thief in the night. Somebody wave at me. If you heard that, you said it to somebody. That's not true. That is not true. <laughs> somebody says, well, prove it to me then. All right. Let's go to 2 Peter 3.10 real quick. And then I'll come back over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let me break this down. All right, here we go. 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord, everybody say the day of the Lord, will come as a thief in the night. When's the day of the Lord coming? It's coming as a thief in the night. Now here, write this word down. It's a... Uh, I could give it to you uh, in, in, in total, but I'm going to spell it for you. K-L-E-P-T-E-S. K-L-E-P-T-E-S is 2812 if you want to go study it. Kleptos. Kleptos. It comes from klepto, which is 2813. You ever heard of a kleptomatic maniac, kleptomaniac, whatever they call them? The word means thief. It means somebody who's also a false teacher. Now, the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. Not Jesus. The day of the Lord. Because Jesus is not a thief and Jesus is not a false teacher. Go study the words out. That's what it means. It means a false teacher and also means it means uh, uh, somebody who is a thief, a liar, a cheater, a deceiver, and that is not him. All right? So let's finish that, finish that off. In which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth shall, and the works thereof, uh, therein shall be burnt up. That's coming, isn't it? It's coming on at an appointed time. So go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and let's look at that part and let's make this connection. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. Again, it's the day of the Lord, not the Lord coming, not the rapture. Why does he have to steal me if he owns me? Why is he breaking into the church and stealing when he owns it all? He's not a thief. 
Okay, so he doesn't have to do that. But that's been the saying. That's been the mantra for pre-tribulation. He's coming as a thief in the night and you're not going to know it. You better get saved. You're going to wake up and grandma's gone. It's, it's not going to happen that way. For whom they shall say, verse 3, for when they shall say, sorry, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail, everybody say travail, upon a woman and child and uh, with child and uh, sh they shall not escape. Peace and safety. So again, we bring that out, peace and safety. Oh, it's just talking about, well, you know, when they signed the peace treaty. No, it is not only talking about when they signed the peace treaty. I'm going to show you later on the overlay in the book of Revelation where there is that peace and safety. How many of y'all know that when the Antichrist comes, he doesn't come with horns on his head. He comes as a man of peace, false peace, lying signs and wonders and miracles. That's why he's an Antichrist. Okay? He'll have all the lying signs and wonders of heaven but he will be deceptive and people will not know the true deceptive purposes until he reveals himself when he commits the abomination that causes desolation. So I'm getting ahead of myself for a reason because we look at that and we say, uh, well, see, uh, we're out of here right at the peace treaty. We're, we're gone, peace and safety, and we're out of here. No, that's not what that is implying. Okay? Okay. And so uh, let's go on to verse four. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. Wait a minute. Wait, I, I, now I'm messed up. I thought he was talking to the Christians and getting, getting raptured and the thief in the night was coming. But now, man, this guy. Read it. But ye, brethren, who? Me, you, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Well, goodness gracious, that's the part they forgot on the Left Behind series. They do. They, they leave something out. Let me, that little bit means a lot. You buy a new car with no engine, that means a lot. You didn't buy a car, you bought a piece of metal. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. That that day, that day, that day, that day, what day? The day of the Lord. It's coming as a thief in the night. Again, he's not a thief I'm not stolen property. He's not breaking and entering B and E to my house, to your house, to his house. He has the key. He owns it all. Okay. And so when you start to look at the pre-tribulation rapture, it doesn't fit. And if it don't fit, you got to acquit. Remember that? If it don't fit, you got to acquit. And it doesn't work. And I'm only giving you a thimble full so far. And we got some more, some more highway to go. So it says he comes as a thief in the night. Well, okay, if the Lord's coming at, as a thief in the night and, and, and it's the rapture and all that, then what night is it? Is it a night in Tokyo or is it a night in Chicago? Man, is it, a, is it the night in Moscow or is it the night in Havana? Oh, I'd see, I don't know how to fix this. Right? He's coming at night as a thief. Well, what night? You can't reconciliate it unless you understand Scripture and you understand the feast of God, which I'll show you later on. But they try to say, it's, a, it's just night. Don't worry about it. It's at night. Really? What night? What's the guy in, in, in Bangladesh going to do? No, he's coming as a thief in the night. He's coming as a thief as far as they're unaware. They are going to be in such rebellion against God, and I'll show it to you much later. They're going to be in rebellion against God. They're going to be in this mindset of peace and safety. They're going to be in this mindset of, of all of this craziness, and then, bam, it's going to happen. And to them, it would be like a thief. Anybody ever been robbed before? What a great feeling that is. What a violation of your core existence to walk in and see your stuff disheveled or uh, a car broken into. That's not a good feeling, is it? That's not the feeling for you and me. That ain't the feeling of the rapture. I'm not going to feel like I'm violated when I'm raptured. 
when we're out of here, it's going to be awesome. All right? And well, we're going to get to that point. So, so that's, something, that's something to look at. The other, the other question mark I put here in my notes is steal away. Question mark, steal away? He's going to steal me away? He doesn't have to do that to me. He doesn't have to do that to anybody that is his. He owns us. We're bought with his precious blood. Okay? All right. So let's go. Um, so, so you see, did you see that connection between chapter four and chapter five? Of, of, of if, if we accept, and, and I do, chapter four as, as an illustration of the rapture, perfect illustration, absolutely. Timing is wrong for pre-tribulation, folks. But we believe it is the description, and we're going to find out where it is later. But then he connects it with the day of the Lord. All right, so we're, we're doing pretty good with our evidence. I think we got a case going on, don't you? All right, so now go to Second Thessalonians. Just flip over there, not too far of a drive. And let's go, <clears throat> let's start verse one. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. I appreciate you doing all those notes too, that helps. Uh, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled by the books you read or the movies you saw. Oh, I'm sorry. Neither by the spirit, nor by word, nor by letter. It was the same thing. Nor by letter as from us that the day of Christ is at hand. And so somebody was spreading a rumor. Remember Veggie Tales, the rumor weed? <laughs> uh, somebody was setting a rumor out, and, and, and people were thinking because terrible things were happening. Uh, Christ was crucified. Uh, there was persecution going on with the church. Obviously, these are the last days in tribulation. All right, so Paul has to fix that. That you be not soon shaken in mind and troubled. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you. What's he talking? He said, don't let no man deceive you about what? The chronological timing and the Kairos timing of God. Don't let nobody deceive you by any means that that day shall not come except there be or come a falling away first. The word first in the Greek is proton. It's first in order, proton, all right? So what has to happen first? A falling away. Are we watching a falling away take place? Absolutely. That the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So the day of Christ, the coming of the Lord, cannot happen until there's the apostate church. It's completely fallen away. The rapture can't happen until the son of perdition is revealed. Now watch. If we agree upon that so far, let's move on. Who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God and that is worship so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Does he start out that way? No. No. So the writer, Paul, is making a connection. He's not stopping, talking about a rapture, and then he goes up. He's making it all understandable as though he was in a court of law. You're, see, you're reading the same thing I'm reading. Where's the break? There's no break. He's making the connection, the day of Christ, the coming of the Lord, with what? Apostasy? Is that right? The falling away? The son of sin or the son of perdition? The man of sin, the uh, son of perdition, the Antichrist is revealed. When is he revealed? He's revealed in the temple. So you've already blown past pre-tribulation. <clears throat> Boom. It's shot out of the water. If you would be honest with yourself, let go and accept the word of God. What I mean by let go is let go of all these old 
teachings that are an error. And that's why you have so many people in the body of Christ, especially in America, resisting what's happening right now. It's not happening. It's not happening. It's not. Yes, it is. You're watching your White House go in flames. You're watching everything uh, that, that you thought that you had a hold of go in flames. The church is being decimated. On and on it goes. But these are part of the prophetic processes that the Lord Jesus, number one, told us, but the apostles and the prophets laid out for us. <clears throat> are you seeing it with me? Remember not that when I was what yet with you, I told you these things. Now watch this. Now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only now, uh, and only uh, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, I've taught this for years. You've heard it for years. That's the church. Your church taken out of the way and Antichrist can come. Come on, Antichrist. <laughs> We're out of here. You can have my pulpit. <laughs> you can have my church and use my building. No. Yes, it is, Pastor, because we're holding back the forces of darkness. <laughs> Lightsaber. Really? How well have we done? Not do good. We got a big F if this was a report card. We got homosexuality and marriage in our country. We've got abortion rampant. We got blah, 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 blah. What'd the church do? And you're going to stop the Antichrist? You see how crazy that is? But that's what we were taught. This is what we preached. We're, we're here until when we leave, it's all going to go to hell. Hey, we're in hell <laughs> with our nation. And it's only going to get worse. I'm not making light of people's theology. I'm, what I'm making light of is the way we've been duped. He said, don't be deceived. Don't let nobody by letter, by spirit, by word, by anything. It can't come until these things happen. And so the pre-tribulation rapture view is heresy. Now somebody just fell off their chair. <gasps> I can't believe he just said that. It's not right. And it's lulled people to sleep. It's made lazy Christians. You're not a, any better of an evangelist because you believe in pre-trib. In fact, you're a worse evangelist. Because you, you, you're not worried about nothing. Well, they can go to hell if they want, I'm out. No, somebody who understands scripture says, I don't, you're going to go through some bad times and I want to give you the answers. And besides that, you may not make it to tomorrow. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's already working. Paul understood that the spirit of Antichrist was already on the earth. It was working through Herod. It was working through all the other leaders of the world. Paul saw it face to face. He saw the face of the devil and evil through leadership and, and, and church folks and all that. He knew what he was talking about. And the, and, the, and the prophetic precursors we've seen over the ages of Hitler and others. Verse, verse 8, And then shall that wicked one be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with, his, with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Whoa. So he's revealed in the totality of who he is. And then a short period of time, and I, I can't let it out. I got to get to that point. He's consumed by the Lord. When? At his coming. Jesus don't come a bunch of times. He doesn't land and get up, land and get up. And he comes one time, one specific time. And I'll show that to you. And, and, and that'll make other people mad. Some people believe in another rapture. They're going to be raptured and transformed. I'm going to kick that cow over. That's not true. <clears throat> that is not true. I'm just going to kick cows over. I don't care. I love eating cows, but I'm going to kick a couple. How's that? So, again, oh, the Holy, the Holy Spirit. Here's the other thing they say. The church is out of here, right? So the evil one can come. The son of perdition, the Antichrist. Then they say, um, the Holy Spirit is out of here. 
The Holy Spirit will never leave the earth. His job is to save and convict and convince men of their sin. If you go into the book of Revelation and to the time of tribulation, you will see people are still getting saved. You can't get saved without the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit doesn't leave in the rapture. Where are we all going? I mean, what are we doing? We're just going to leave? We're just going to leave and just goodbye. That is so foreign to truth. That's so foreign to the Lord. That's so foreign to the character of God. He said, I will never leave you, never forsake you. Oh, but the church will. (laughs) Because it's too hot in the kitchen. No, sir. It doesn't work that way. I'm making some people mad. I can see smoke coming out of the camera. Even him who come, who's coming is after the working of Satan and all power signs lying in wonders. We got to find out where that is. You might want to write down, that down as number six in your one thing of, of trying to find this. Where, where, where do we find that at? We got to find out where, where that happened. We got to find the false prophet, don't we? Man, this don't fit too good, does it? This, this is messing some folk up. No, it's helping you. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, them that perish. He's still talking. He hasn't left context. He hasn't left content. He's still talking about the last days. He's talking about tribulation. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. In the book of Revelation, when I get to this place and I put this temple on top of it, we find people raising their fists to Almighty God while their skin has boils and all of the incredible bold judgments that come down of the wrath of God and they still, how dare you? I don't understand that. Well, we do it today. We do it today and this is only a thimble full of the judgment of God. All right, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? That they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth and that had pleasure in unrighteousness. So Paul is giving us this understanding that Jesus does not return until the Antichrist is revealed. He's sitting in his temple and these things begin to transpire. Let me ask you, has the temple been built yet? No. Now there's some people on YouTube saying, oh, it's built. No, it's not. There's pieces, there's instruments, there's all kinds of stuff that's underneath the temple mount. I know all about that stuff. They're not gonna raise the temple out of the ground. They're going to build the temple. There's all kinds of division of where it's going to be built. Some say there's millimeters of space between the Dome of the Rock and it can be built next to it. On and on it goes. I'm not going to argue that. What I'm telling you is the temple's not built yet. They're not worshiping in that temple just yet. Okay? And so if it's not been built yet, then the rapture can't happen at any moment. Unless they're using Legos... It's going to take a while to build it after the, peace, the, the signing of the peace treaty. Is that right? There's another death blow to the pre-tribulation rapture. I taught it for years and years and years. As soon as the ink is dried on the contract. We're out of here, folks. Are you ready? How many of y'all remember that? I, man, I, I pull a lot of people to the altar <laughs> with that thing. It got people saved, but... You know, was it good doctrine? Not really. Preached good, sounded good. And that's the problem we have in the church. Just a bunch of people got stuff that sounds good. It ain't right. All right. I want you to write this down. The end time message. You ready for this? The end time message is about redemption, not escaping. The end time message is not It's about redemption, not about escaping. If you flip what I just said and you make it about escaping, then you've missed the redemptive plan of God. 
and you don't understand eschatology. You don't understand the heart of God. You don't understand what he's trying to do. You're worried about saving your own hide. And that's why you preach this. And that's why, you know, you make money on your YouTube channels. And let me, let me say something about this YouTube stuff that's out there. And you got people, and this really irritates me. You have people who have dreams, prophetic dreams, and they say it's the rapture and these different things and, and get people so messed up and it's not theologically straight, it's not scriptural about it, it's beautiful. And I'll even say this, maybe you did see the rapture, but your timing is completely wrong because it doesn't line up with, the, the word does not line up with your prophecy. Your prophecy lines up with the word of God. And I've heard stuff and people sent me stuff and oh, fuzzy, bubbly, butterflies oh wow it's going to be wonderful that isn't biblical that is i saw hard times and i saw us out of here well you might have saw that but you didn't see the seven years you didn't see the totality and so i kind of doubt it's from god because God's not going to go back on his word. He's not going to allow something. So be careful with that. If somebody gives you a rapture video or something, be careful with that. If it don't line up with the word, toss it. Now, that was some good pizza they had, but, but just, just toss it. Hey, I'm out of time. I got so much more to give, uh, but that's all I can get to you tonight. So to recap real quick. Uh, you know, is there a rapture? Absolutely. Is it the secret rapture? Nope. Is, is it found in First Thessalonians chapter 4? The one part I read, yes. But then Paul goes into chapter 5 and he speaks of the day of the Lord and then he speaks of things that must take place. And so what we have to be careful is uh, taking a truth that is of the Lord and then twisting it to what fits for our modern day. And uh, that, that's, called, that's called error and it could be heresy as well. Father, thank you. We do look forward to the great getting up day. We do look forward to being with you forever. But Father, we're gonna, we're gonna follow what your word says so that we have a roadmap to go by on this Revelation road right to the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for it. Bless us in Jesus' name, amen. I love you. I'll see you Sunday.